Hello everybody, and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now for the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. On May the 3rd, 1992, Zahi Hawass agreed to close the Great Pyramid for a week, so that Rudolf Gantenbrink and his team could examine the King's Chamber air shafts, but only on the promise that Gantenbrink could improve the ventilation of the pyramid. Gantenbrink agreed, and work started on May the 4th. He went to the outlet of the King's Chamber northern shaft, high up on the northern face of the pyramid, directly above the main entrance. He had previously noted that the King's Chamber southern shaft was free of sand and debris, but the northern one, which had a much flatter angle of ascent, required a major cleaning effort. The small opening, located 80 metres at the side of the pyramid, measured around 30 centimetres square. It was tiny, but behind the opening was a tunnel, more than 11 metres long, and it had been crudely dug out along the shaft some time in antiquity. The tunnel measured around 70 centimetres square, and was large enough for one man to squeeze inside, but it had been filled with 4 cubic metres of sand, stones and debris. Gantenbrink and his team cleared it out, naming the tunnel the Mankiller, because once clear, it was akin to a trap, like something you'd expect to see in an Indiana Jones film. Force your way through the narrow entrance, and straight away you'd slide down to the bottom of the dark narrow chute, caught up in an avalanche of dust and stone, having little air to breathe. As the tunnel was cleared, they uncovered an artefact from a previous mission to clear it out. Whether it belonged to John Perring in the early 19th century, or Morton Edgar in the early 20th, it's hard to say. It was a badly corroded four-wheeled vehicle, wide enough to just fit into the shaft. It was made of solid iron and weighed around 30 kilograms. It was probably used as a battering ram, to try and dislodge the material in the shaft but, as Gantenbrink says, it clearly failed. Gantenbrink had cleared out the Mankiller Tunnel, but the small shaft that continued beyond the tunnel going into the pyramid was still totally plugged with sand, large stones and rubble. As the old battering ram had clearly made no progress in antiquity, it's unlikely the stones could be pushed down the shaft. Pushing would just compact the debris. So, Gantenbrink had a plan for a different sort of ram. On May the 5th, he and his team sharpened one end of a truck axle and welded a large chisel onto it. They then carried their contraption of the northern side of the pyramid to the entrance of the Mankiller Tunnel. With a rope attached to the rear end, they sent it sliding down the chute. It accelerated for a few seconds and then crashed into the plug of debris, and it did successfully break up some of the large stones into smaller pieces. They did it again, and then again, and on this third attempt, hundreds of kilos of dust and debris poured down the King's Chamber northern shaft, ending up in Captain Cavillia's tunnel, which was dug in the early 19th century and located here inside the pyramid. It's accessed on the right, just as you leave the Grand Gallery heading towards the King's Chamber. The interior of the Great Pyramid was clouded in dust for several hours, but for the first time in a very long time, the King's Chamber northern shaft was clear. Two days later and Giza was hit by a sandstorm, loading the shaft with a fresh quantity of sand yet again. Work began to clear it out, and, on completion, a 12 metre long plastic water pipe was inserted into the Mankiller Tunnel, with masonry packed around it to keep it in place. Metal bars were added to protect the end of the pipe at the outlet. Here we can see the finished product. Gantenbrink is on the right, and after securing and clearing the shaft, he worked at ventilators inside the pyramid, successfully reducing the humidity inside. Humidity is very damaging to the pyramid, and so what Gantenbrink did is some of the most important work in the monument's modern history. But the story of the shaft clearance led me to take a closer look at what he called the Mankiller Tunnel. 
Here we can see it marked on Gantenbrink's CAD diagram. As he says in his label, the upper blocks are partly destroyed because of the creation of the Mankiller Tunnel. But why was a tunnel created around the end of the King's Chamber northern shaft? Who created it and why? On his diagram, Gantenbrink calls it a robber's tunnel, but in my 90 minute Great Pyramid documentary from a few years ago, I speculated it was actually dug by the pyramid builders to replace one or more of the U shaped shaft blocks. This could have been due to a defect only noticed late in the construction phase, or as I speculated, if Khufu did enlarge his pyramid, extending the air shafts would be an intricate and difficult part of the job. The excess weight of the pyramid core masonry could cause the air shaft blocks to buckle at the point of extension. The only way you could reach a broken or buckled shaft block would be to excavate a tunnel from the outside, wide enough for a human to fit inside, and that's what I speculated is the origins of the Mankiller Tunnel. But this week I've come across a YouTube channel I've never seen before, and it's called Lines in Sand, and I've linked it below in the description. The owner of the channel, a man named Sean, has a video called Who Created the Mankiller Tunnel. He respectfully mentions my previous work, but says the tunnel was created by Captain Cavillia in the early 19th century, referring to the opinion of Keith Hamilton, as he says in his fantastic Layman's Guide to the Great Pyramid. In this guide, Keith shows this diagram by John Perring. Perring is quoted as saying, this, on plate 4, is a section of the exit of the same northern air channel, which for 47 feet 6 inches from the exterior has been forced downwards. When discovered, this forced part itself, aka the Mankiller Tunnel, was filled up with desert sand, which has been cleared out as well as the southern air shaft by Colonel Howard Weiss, and the ventilation of the pyramid has been restored. Earlier in his writings, Perring does specifically state that Cavillia excavated along the northern air shaft, but this was close to where the shaft begins, this area located here. But he doesn't specifically say that Cavillia was responsible for the Mankiller Tunnel. In his fantastic layman's guide, Hamilton believes the tunnel could well have been the work of Cavillia, and credit to Hamilton, this is a fair assumption to make, because Cavillia did spend a lot of time inside the pyramid, doing a lot of excavation and destructive prospection. But as far as I'm aware, there is no direct reference that states Cavillia was the man responsible. Remember, Perring says, when discovered, this forced part, aka the Mankiller Tunnel, was filled up with desert sand. And, I don't know about you, but to me that sentence just doesn't imply that Perring believed this to be a somewhat recent excavation by Cavillia. I did some more digging, following the actions of Cavillia at the Great Pyramid through various writings. We know he was working at the Great Pyramid in 1817, employed by Henry Salt, and was then later employed by Howard Weiss and John Perring in the 1830s. In the writings available concerning Cavillia's activities at the Pyramid, which are by no means thorough and in-depth, there is no mention that he tunnelled into the Pyramid from the northern edge. Howard Weiss states that on February the 23rd, 1836, Cavillia informed Weiss he had made this excavation along the northern air shaft, and that he attempted to force the mouth of the southern air shaft in the King's Chamber. Cavillia then told Weiss that he believed that these channels did lead to other chambers, and by excavating in their direction they might be discovered. Weiss did say that Cavillia could continue to explore the air shafts at his expense, but he declined the offer and would not engage. Why, we don't know. On the 12th of February 1837, Weiss records quite clearly that it was John Perring that discovered the opening of the northern air shaft on the northern face of the pyramid, not Captain Cavillia. In the footnotes, Weiss also mentions the Mankiller Tunnel saying, 
there had been an excavation to the length of 37 feet along the upper end of the channel, and a great many stones removed from the face of the pyramid near it. It is surprising that it had not been sooner discovered, particularly as, according to Cavillia, sulphur, ropens and pitch had been burnt in the lower part of it. People had apparently been sent over the exterior in order to detect the outlet, by the smell or by the smoke, but it was never found before perrying, probably because the shaft and mancula tunnel were backed up with sand and debris. The day after the discovery, men were employed to clear out the mancula tunnel, which Vice says was 3 foot by 2 foot 9 inches by 37 feet in length. It took five days to clear before coming to the opening of the small air shaft, which continued into the pyramid but was also full of sand and stones. Vice does say that various instruments were used to try and clear it, and maybe one such instrument was the corroded iron ram that was found by Gantenbrink. Eventually, the air shaft was cleared with the assistance of boring rods, and ventilation was restored to the pyramid. So, I think we can rule out the Mancula Tunnel was the creation of Cavillia. It was unknown to Vice until Perring discovered it, and he also mentions an older attempt to locate it, led by Captain Cavillia himself, and this attempt did fail. So, although we can never be sure about anything that took place in the 19th century, the Mancilla Tunnel does look to predate Cavillia, Vice and Perring, and was therefore likely created before the 19th century. With limited resources, a poor historical record, and just one photograph of its interior, the origins of the Mancilla Tunnel can only be speculated. I do think it's possible the tunnel could have been dug in the Old Kingdom. As I alluded to in the past, it could have been dug to replace deeper shaft blocks that may have become buckled or broken. At the minute, if nothing else, there is no evidence I'm aware of to dismiss the claim. I guess it could also have been the work of tomb robbers, trying to bore their way in from the outside, although this does seem laborious and unlikely. It could have also been created by the Caliph al Mamun, who we know was also keen to uncover the secrets of the Great Pyramid. And yes, as Hamilton does suspect, it could have been created by Cavillia, and he simply didn't tell anyone and didn't record it. Maybe he didn't have the permission to dig a tunnel on the pyramid, but did it anyway and kept stum. All in all, with a limited information available, it's another pyramid mystery we're no closer to resolving, but it's these fascinating details of the Great Pyramid I love researching the most. If I find out anything more about it, I'll be sure to report it here on the Ancient Architects channel, so please do subscribe. I've just revived my old channel called Space and Planet, where I'll be making regular content looking at Earth and space science news and research. If you're interested in any of these subjects, please do subscribe to the channel, as I've got some fantastic ideas for new content in the coming months. I've left a link in the comments, and it's also in the description below. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.